Um, as many of you know, this is uh, a guest lecture in conjunction with the classes and I teach um, uh, Humanities 407, uh, kind of awesome, regarding the blind in art and science. Um, and Russ and I are extremely pleased, thrilled to, uh, to welcome to campus today Dr. Elizabeth Kessler. Um, this talk tonight is entitled, Displaying the Beauty of the Truth, Couple Images as Art and Science. Professor Kessler uh, is currently on the faculty in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford University, where she teaches a number of courses, um, such as, I just picked a couple of them, with really great titles, uh, Picturing the Cosmos, Cars in the American Landscape, uh, Technology in the Visual Imagination, and Beyond the Art-Science Divide. Dr. Kessler earned her master's degree in art history from the University of Chicago, and her PhD in the Department of History of Culture at the University of Chicago in 2006, uh, with her dissertation entitled Space Gates, Romantic Aesthetics and the Hubble Space Telescope Images. Recently, Dr. Kessler was awarded the Smithsonian Institute National Air and Space Museum Guggenheim Fellowship and the NASA, uh, NASA Fellowship in the History of Space Technology. Uh, her first book, which, which members of the class will be uh, very familiar, Picturing the Cosmos, Hubble Space Telescope Images and the Astronomical Sublime, uh, is on the, um, the aesthetics of deep space images. It was published in 2012, and I'm sure I've told this story before, but it was in fact this book, uh, which I stumbled across uh, at an, uh, a conference in New York in, in February of 2012, the College Art Association Conference, that actually prompted this very course. Um, so much so, so, so much was uh, my enthusiasm about this, this book that I actually started snapping uh, pictures of the cover of the, the text and sent them to our provost and thought, we got to do something with this. And it was from this book that really launched a um, kind of interdisciplinary dialogue and conversation that led to a course being taught by an art historian, myself, uh, and scientists. Um, Professor Kessler's uh, publications, other publications, include, and again, I'll just name a couple of them, Astrophysics and Cartography, and star maps, both in the history of cartography, volume six, retaking the universe, historicizing appropriated astronomical images, uh, published in Artifacts, Studies in the History of Science and Technology, and a chapter uh, from which I believe tonight's talk comes in the new book, Hubble's Legacy, Reflections by Those Who Dreamed It, Built It, and Observed the Universe with It which has just been released this month through the uh, Smithsonian Institution Scholarly Press. Professor Kessler is currently at work on a new book project titled Extraterrestrial Time Capsules, uh, Postcards for Aliens, Postscripts for Us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Kessler. Has, has 
given scientists a remarkably clear view of the universe. Um, the data about, delivered by the telescope has helped them to better understand the universe, its history, its makeup. Um, but those outside of the scientific community, those who aren't specialists in astronomy, are probably much less familiar with the scientific, the breakthroughs, the scientific breakthroughs in astronomy and cosmology that the Hubble has encouraged. But I'm willing to bet that all of you, all of us, are familiar with the Hubble images. These vividly <coughs> colored, dramatically lit, uh, carefully composed pictures of, of the universe. You might not have recognized where they came from, but I'm sure you've seen them. Um, they show up on all sorts of things, like coffee mugs, calendars, um, they hang in planetariums. So here's a planetarium where you can see there's a Hubble image, here's one over here, here's another one. Um, they also show up in art museums, and exhibit at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. Um, they're part of art films, uh, the Tree of Life, that Terrence Malick, very RV uh, director, has these scenes from all images. Science fiction films, this television show about Star Galactica, they actually send you flying through these images inspired by, uh, by Hubble data. And they, the Hubble images have also shaped how other astronomical images look, whether they're images made by professional astronomers who are using data from world-class observatories, or astronomers, amateur astronomers, who are observing the night sky in their backyard, backyard with their home telescope. All of these images of the cosmos have been shaped by, influenced by the aesthetic sensibility that the Hubble images have helped, helped establish as a standard for picturing the universe. So whether we're astronomy, buff, astronomy buffs or not, we've probably seen and admired these fantastic, awe-inspiring images of nebulae and galaxies and star fields. They've really become part of our visual culture. And, and that's really what makes these images, I think, so significant. Everyone, you know, NASA administrators and astronomers around the world, and the congressmen who are writing checks to support the project throughout the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, um, and, and the general public. Everyone expected the Hubble would, as an instrument, influence and shape scientific understandings of the cosmos. But I think it's done something more than that. Um, because of the wide circulation, because of the aesthetic response they elicit, They've, they've helped to reshape how we imagine, how we experience the universe. So one of the best known examples uh, of, of Hubble images is this one, um, the section of the Eagle Nebula. Uh, it often goes by the name of the Pillars of Creation. And it's a name that, that describes the formation of stars, a, a process that astronomers identify as happening within, within this uh, uh, nebulae. But it also has, I mean, pillars of creation have a lot of, of resonance to it, right? When you hear it, it's hard not to hear uh, the voice of, of the, that astronomer and great popularizer of science, Carl Sagan, and tell me we are all made of star stuff. Or if you've been watching the Green of Cosmos, maybe you're Neil deGrasse Tyson saying. But, um, but this picture actually, within the history of the Hubble Space Telescope, it came, it was, it was released relatively soon after the Hubble Space Telescope was Prepared, and it really helped to revive the reputation of the telescope, to kind of publicly show that yes, this instrument that so much money, so much time, so much effort had been spent on, can actually live up to the expectations that people had for it. Um, and people responded, and it also did something else too. It sort of showed the visual potential for Hubble images. It showed that not only can it do good science, but in fact, it can create these really fantastic views of the cosmos, and it encouraged um, those who were working in astronomy to, to want to ensure that there was a regular production of, um, no, that's not good, of, of uh, these aesthetically developed um, Hubble uh, images. Like that, no. <laughs> these great vast fields of blue, heaps <laughs> flying. <laughs> Ah, yeah, okay. So it inspired this group of astronomers who work at the space and, and image specialists who work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is a research center at Johns Hopkins that's sort of in charge of all the daily operations of the, the telescope. And it's also the place where it houses a lot of uh, astronomers who are doing research. Um, so a group of them got together and said, how can we ensure that there are actually the regularly regular release of these aesthetically developed images? So they formed this group called the Hubble Heritage Project. 
and took sort of as their charge, as their mission, that each month they would develop and then release an image that was focused on aesthetic qualities. Um, yeah, sure, it would be scientifically important, interesting, and valuable, but the aesthetics would take primacy. Okay. Mike, do you need something? And so many of the images from the Hubble that you're familiar with are actually the handiwork of this group. And, and handiwork, I think, is the right question or the right word to use there, because as savvy users of digital technology and viewers of images, you recognize that the appearance of these images depend, yes, at one level on this advanced telescope orbiting above the Earth and its high power cameras, but it also depends on the careful choices of those who are translating the Hubble's data into dramatic images. Okay, so the High Artist Project members of that group, they had a really difficult problem to deal with. Their images are reaching a really broad audience. Um, everything from fellow scientists to school children and everything in between. So this means they had to grapple with kind of a really tough issue. How do you make an image that is that conveys scientific information and inspires an aesthetic response in a fashion that's legible to a really wide and varied group of people with all sorts of different understandings of science, technology, and the methods of, of crafting pictures. And furthermore, how do you do so do this in a manner that will sort of I don't know not lose its relevancy as these circulate in all these different forms and shapes as you've seen. Uh, um, and it's not surprising then, given the sort of difficulty of their task, that the results are complex ent entities, these images, um, that raise questions about the place of images within science, the epistemological value, how it is that they contribute to what we know, um, and the relationship of these images to larger visual tradition. And it's that last question um, I want to focus on today um, when I say I want to talk about the whether or not we think about Hubble images. And I should say, too, if at any point I say something that is not clear, does not make sense, or you just simply have a question, um, and I was totally clear, we'll go for that. Feel free, raise your hand, you know, it's, it's not a big group, I'm happy to take tangents and diversions along the way. Um, okay, so on to this question about art versus science. So we often think about science and art as very separate and distinct. The arts speak to senses, to feelings, to intuitions, whereas the sciences engage reason, rationality, evidence. The arts are ambiguous, uncertain, subjective, whereas the sciences are precise, exact, objective. Um, and 55 years ago, this British chemist and, and, and novelist named C.P. Snow uh, famously described art and science as two cultures with different histories, philosophies, different approaches to solving the world's problems. Um, and there he is, pictured in all his um, English academics. Um, so much of his essay really sort of reflects the historical era. It's written in 1959, from which it comes. It's kind of mid-20th century faith in the power of technology and science to solve the world's problems. But he did seem to think that the artistic effects had the better but, um, so Snow first made this claim in a lecture that he gave at Cambridge in the UK, not across the river here, um, and there were immediate responses to it. There were other lectures given, he published an essay, there were responses in the UK, there were responses in the US. This kind of debate about whether this, this characterization was accurate, right, so on and so forth. And it's remarkable that, that it remains this kind of, uh, the notion of two cultures continues to occupy people today. Sometimes it gets translated into new language. Um, at Stanford, where, where I teach, um, students describe classes, they describe majors, sometimes they describe themselves as either fuzzy, the humanities, or techie, the sciences, um, with all the kinds of associations I was just listing a second ago. Okay. And there's something really attractive about kind of dividing the world that way. It's easy to think about art and science as these separate domains with distinct methods and understandings of the world, to imagine them as 
asking and answering different kinds of questions, and, and to believe they really share very much, very little with each other, I should say. Um, and I think dividing them in that way encourages anyone, actually, and Snow and Snow did, to sort of take sides. One or the other is the better one at addressing the problems that we face in the world. And I think the appeal, too, though, lies of, of a dichotomy or binary like that, is that it's also endlessly enjoyable to kind of break it down, to kind of find the moments of communion, the moments of connectedness, um, um, the ways in which one art relies on the other, or sort of relies on science or back and forth. And we might think about the Hubble images as a kind of bridge between these two cultures. Um, and they have characteristics that align them with both art and science. So I'm going to turn now to some of those The first, of course, is their study power. Um, these images aren't dim, they aren't blurry, they're not monochromatic, um, as many of the images that astronomers use when they're sitting at their laptop analyzing data, those kinds of images fall there. Here we see these very aesthetically developed images. They portray the universe with great precision, with brilliant colors, dramatic lighting, in these carefully composed frames. So here in this portrait of the Eagle Nebula, these three pillars of gas and dust reach up and seem to almost fill the frame here. Um, it gives us this, this section of a larger cloud of gas and dust, a sense of monumentality, a sense of grandeur. Here we see NGC. Uh, Can I ask a question about that last one? Yes, yeah, sure. Was the Hubble actually rotated to get it to match like that? The, yeah, it was pointed in the direction so that the object would fit within the frame of the camera. Mm -hmm. So the, the astronomer who, um, so in order to collect the data, astronomers submit a proposal to the Space Telescope Science Institute and say, I want to observe, or usually a team of astronomers, I want to observe this, and here's my justification for why I think I should observe this, and this is what kinds of answers are that I hope to answer with this, or, or kinds of questions I hope to answer with this kind of research and so on, and here's where you should point the telescope. And so the astronomer who was responsible for this is a guy named Jeff Hester. Um, he used to teach at Arizona State. He's since retired. Um, and um, he told me, yeah, that he carefully chose the pointing so that it would fit, the clouds of gas and dust would fit within the frame of the camera. Yeah. Is this picture dated by any? Is it what? Of the sublimes, 
an intense aesthetic experience um, associated with events that threaten to overwhelm our human limitations, um, whether that's through their power or their seeming incomprehensibility. And I understand you've read Burke and Kant, so I won't go into all the distinctions between their different notions of the sublime. Beyond saying that, um, for me, the Kantian notion of the sublime, this idea that uh, the experience engages both the senses and reason and brings them together um, in this kind of uh, vibration, uh, kind of oscillation, with the, re with the sense of sort of failing to fully grasp the infinite, but reason being able to get a sense of the concept. That's the part of the sublime that I find most useful in thinking about the Hubble image. Okay. So, when it comes to aesthetics, I think astronomical images have something of a leg up on many other scientific images. The subject matter, the scale, and the means of production uh, set them up as really exemplars of the sublime. As you know, both Burke and Kant listed the starry sky as one of the defining examples of the sublime. Uh, Burke considered contemplating the stars to be sort of the guaranteed experience of the sublime, and he writes, quote, the starry heavens, although it occurs very frequently in our view, never fails to excite an idea of grandeur. And for Kant, the vastness of the universe, especially its relationship to the scale of humans, exemplified what he called the mathematical sublime. And it's a really long quote, so I put it all up here, but I read it. Uh, and he writes, nature offers examples of the mathematically sublime in mere intuition. Whenever our imagination is given, not so much a larger numerical concept as a large unity for measure to shorten the numerical series. A tree that we estimate by a man's height will do as standard for estimating the height of a mountain. If the mountain were to be about a mile high, it can serve as a unity for the number that expresses the Earth's diameter, and so make that diameter intuitable. The Earth's diameter can serve similarly for estimating the planetary system familiar to us, and that in turn for estimating the Milky Way system. And the immense multitude of such Milky Way systems, called nebulous stars, which presumably form another such system among themselves, do not lead us to expect any boundaries here. Now, when we judge such an immense whole aesthetically, the sublime lies not so much in the magnitude of the number as in the fact that the farther we progress, the larger are the unities we reach. So here, Kant is describing our ability to conceive of the relative size of things that dwarf the human scale. Uh, by comparing tree to mountain, mountain to earth's circumference, earth's circumference to the solar system, and so on, we find ourselves understanding immensity and experiencing the thrill of that understanding as well. And this idea of a kind of comparative sense of scale is so wonderfully illustrated by Powers of Ten, which I think you guys also watched earlier, the film by Ray and Charles Eames. <laughs> American architects and designers and, and filmmakers. It's probably one of the few classrooms that doesn't have an Eames chair in it. <laughs> um, usually there are, there's one around. Anyway, um, so we <coughs> don't mention Kant as an influence, but the similarities here I think are really striking. That quote that I just read and what they do in Powers of Ten. You know, the film kind of zooms you out from, from the picnic on the shores of Lake Michigan um, out to the distant reaches of, of the universe and then back in to the picnic, picnickers and down to the, 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 the atomic scale. So you compare then the figures on the picnic blanket to a city and then out to the edges of the universe and so on. But there's a, there's a subtle distinction here. Kant expects us to imagine such a journey, to use our minds to conceive of it, to mentally take that trip. Uh, and let our minds actually go beyond where our senses can. Whereas the eases, through the technology of film, actually take us through an experience of it. And I think in their representation of scale, the Hubble images sit somewhere between this kind of imagined uh, version of it that Kant proposes and the pictured version that the eases do. Um, a single image doesn't always take us on this comparative journey. However, if you take them as kind of a collection, all these Hubble images, and you see several of them at once, it becomes possible to get a sense of this kind of comparative scale. So if you look at here, this sweeping, sweeping layers of gas and dust, you see these little um, pillars within, and you start to realize, wait, that looks really very similar to something like the Eagle Nebula, or this other example of pillars of gas and dust. 
Um, and so by comparing these different images, you start to get an appreciation for the scale of what you're actually seeing here. This monumentality that's conveyed in these images, even greater than is the size of the demo that you're looking at here. And sometimes, though, a single image will give you a sense of that. Something like the tadpole uh, galaxy, as you see here, in the foreground, the big kind of sweeping bright uh, region. But if you look at some of the other regions in the background, and you start to realize, oh, those are actually galaxies, you start to again get that sense of a comparative size and scale, and a sense of the vastness, then, of what you're looking at. So another aspect um, of these Hubble images, I think, that we're always somewhat aware of is that I mean, and this has already come up with some of the questions we've asked, that these are dependent on technology, human technology. And I think we can also think about the technological support as contributing to our experience of the Hubble Space Telescope images. The audacity of sending an orbiting telescope up into the air, something that, and that it circles there for nearly 25 years now, something that wasn't possible until nearly the end of the 20th century, and that even then, you know, they had mistakes and problems and failures and so on and so forth. So the audacity of doing something like that, I think, contributes to a sense of the technological sublime. And before the telescopes launch, NASA and the various contractors who were involved with building the telescope, they were very, very fond of putting out images like this, where you see the telescope in all its technological sublimity here in the foreground. And then you also see in the background images of what they're predicting the telescope will show you. Um, so you can't actually see such, if you were to go up to where the telescope is orbiting, you wouldn't see that red, blue nebula in the background. Here you're getting a sense, you're seeing here a painting that shows you the telescope in the foreground, and then a kind of imagined view of what these nebula would look like. Um, and this was a particularly popular example of this. Um, I think it first was done when they were, ex they were expecting originally to launch it around 1983, but of course there were delays when they did. But there was actually versions of this um, where there were little astronauts working on the telescope. I only have a really bad black and white zero of that. Um, so that's when you have the ast astronaut list version. Um, now, once the telescope launches, the kind of technological sublime recedes somewhat. We, we are reminded of it, or have been reminded of it, throughout the telescope's history when astronauts have traveled on the space shuttle to on servicing missions to repair certain aspects of, of the telescope and instruments. So you get things like this, where the telescope is attached to the space shuttle, and you have these, these human figures repairing and fixing and replacing different instruments. So again, we don't see that, that, that technological supply in the image itself, but I think it sort of lingers just outside the frame. So we might say that to sum up, that the subject matter, the scale, and the knowledge of how these images are created um, encourage us to respond with a sense of awe, with a sense of, of, of wonder, with a sense of the sublime. Okay. So those who are involved with the Hubble Heritage Project, the aesthetic appeal of these images aligns them, makes them akin to art. They describe them in those terms. So as part of my research, I interviewed a lot of the members of, of that group, and I asked them, what do you think? Are these images art, or are these images science? And Howard Vaughn, who is an astronomer, who is one of the, the founders of the Hubble Heritage Project, he said this. Um, he said he thought of them as, quote, an interface between art and science. And then he went on to describe what he considered to be the goals of the Heritage Project, saying, quote, it has to be a compelling image from the pictorial or artistic point of view. That's the number one criterion. On the other hand, there's certainly scientific implications. There are scientific processes that you can see going on in here, star formation. I mentioned that with the Eagle Nebula. So really, it's a little bit of both, he says. Um, Zola Bay, who's an image specialist with the Hubble Heritage Project, and he has his, he's involved with almost all the images that come out of the Space Telescope Science Institute. He's, he's really kind of the person they rely on to do a lot of the, the, the crafting of the images. He really agreed with Bond, and he said, quote, I think the Heritage Project images are more about art. The heritage images are primarily about the visual. I certainly hope that people are curious about them and want to learn what these things are, but I hope that they stand on their own visually." So 
they, their responses imply that images made solely for scientific purposes would have little aesthetic appeal, whereas the Heritage Project images are made with the intention of engaging our senses, engaging us visually. They convey information too, but that's not the first consideration for the astronomers who are crafting the images or when they choose which image to use. Instead, aesthetic appeal is taking priority. So, as I mentioned before, the appeal of the Hubble images, and here I'm getting to your question, um, depend in part on the choices that are made by LeVay and Bond. Um, astronomers make adjustments to the contrast, to uh, they assign colors, they choose how to orient the images too. And it's that amount of careful crafting that has led others to suggest, let me just show, so here's the Eagle Nebula on the left in the version that's familiar. Here on the right is the version that if you kind of see the raw data, and raw there, every, it's impossible to see raw. There's always something happening between what you get from the telescope and what you see. But you can see that it's, it's much fainter, it's black and white, there's a lot of these kinds of seams between different detectors, there's a scattering of, of white, like sort of salt or something is spilled all over it. Um, it doesn't have the same kind of power as the one on the right. So there's a lot that's happening between the image on the right and then the version on the left. Okay. But this amount of careful crafting has led others who, outside of the Hubble group, to suggest that these should be considered art. So the architect and, and sculptor Maya Lin, who's best known for her, uh, her design for the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., she wrote that, quote, the Hubble Space Telescope has shown us reaches of the universe that until recently were beyond comprehension. But the legibility of these far off realms owes much to the engineers and scientists who interpret that telescope's imagery by specifically selecting the amazing colors we see. When I first saw NASA's renderings of distant nebulae, I realized that these weren't just reference photographs, but rather works of art, and undoubtedly among the most powerful that our generation has produced. So Lynn's there acknowledging, recognizing the essential role of astronomers uh, and their skillful interventions, and that is what she said elevates the Hubble images and transforms them from scientific data into pictures that can elicit this kind of strong emotional response. So although they're derived from scientific observations, these images she proposes suggest, or sorry, express the awe and the wonder that one experiences, whether an astronomer or not, when confronted with the vast size and scale of the cosmos. Okay, so I want to turn now to this question of how to make a Hubble images and describe how it is that astronomers translate the dim, kind of streaky, monochromatic images that I just showed you into the ones that are much more familiar. And then we'll come back to Liz's uh, comments too. Okay. So my quick version of how to make Hubble images. So one of the things that make Hubble images remarkable is their incredible resolution, the great deal of precision that they, should, they have. And part of that comes from the position of the Hubble Space Telescope above the Earth's, above the Earth's atmosphere. So you don't have clouds and an atmosphere and so on obscuring the light from the uh, stars. You can actually see it much more clearly above the atmosphere. Um, and views like this one of the Whirlpool Galaxy give you a sense of how detailed, how precise that resolution is. If you blow up the image and get closer, you start to see that what was just sort of glowing regions of red start to gain definition, form, color, and so on, structure, a degree of intensity. But all those kinds of details aren't immediately evident if we look at the kind of unmanipulated uh, version of, uh, of the images. And here's why. So the Hubble's cameras can detect extremely subtle variations in light intensity. Distinctions that are so fine, so subtle from pixel to pixel, that our eyes wouldn't be able to register them. You can't actually represent them on a printed page or on a computer screen. So from one pixel to the next, you know, you've got just a couple of differences in terms of numeric value of the light intensity that it's measured. So, but it's there. And then what the astronomers want to do is kind of boost that contrast so that you can see those subtle distinctions in light intensity. 
So they do a couple of things in order to boost that kind of contrast, to kind of amplify what's already there as a difference. One is they they cut, or they clip the amount of data that they're showing. They compress the data. Um, so if you look at it, this is a, um, a presentation that Zolt LeVay had posted on his website for a long time. So this, this image processor works with the Hubble Heritage Project, kind of describes the process of adjusting the contrast that they do. And so if you look at the top image, it's all black. You don't see anything at all in terms of, there's nothing to see, right? And if you look at the full range of data on the right, then it's kind of little graph. You see all the activity, all the variation, all the changes, all the way over on the left. Um, and so in order to bring that out, they reduce the scale of the data. So on the top, you see this negative 200 to 16,153. On the bottom, they focused all their attention into the range of data between 0 and 600, and then they've stretched out that data over the full range of possible values of visible to us. And you start to see some change in scale, in scaling, in contrast. You start to see some different tonalities, some grays, and, and so on. But it's still not, there's still a lot of, uh, of the image that's just all black. Um, and so they might reduce the scale, compress the scale even more, stretch it out even further. But as you notice, what you get then with this image is some of the regions become overexposed, just like, you know, totally bleeding out into white. So you're losing some there. So the other step, in addition to reducing the, the range of the data and stretching it uh, out, is to apply mathematical functions to the data. So either a square root, which is what they use to apply to the, the Eagle Nebula images, or they'll take the log of all of the values of the data. And as you can see then, you start to get much greater tonality, much greater variation in the grays, the blacks, the whites. You still get a pure white, maybe around here or here, and a pure black, but you have everything in between. And you start to see all this structure. You get the sense of the, the morphology, the form, the shape of this nebula. We get a sense of three-dimensionality um, to the object. Does that make sense? Yeah? This is another example um, of that process um, applied to the tadpole nebula, um, where you can again see how, in its original version, you see only the kind of brightest center of the galaxy reducing the, the range gives you a little bit more, but you still get overexposed. And then applying different kinds of uh, functions to the data gives you different appearances. And so what they are striving for is to show you an image that most clearly gives you this ra full range of tonal values. At least that's what the heritage is. Okay. So, what do we want to conclude from that? Does that mean it's false, manufactured, that what we see in these images doesn't really exist? No, I would argue no. It's there, it's just not visible to our eyes. And so what they're doing is translating the data into a form that we can actually see it, that we can actually experience it. Those differences exist, but it wouldn't look like that if we were to get into our spaceship and fly off through many light years or whatever, <laughs> to however long it would take to get to the Eagle Nebula, it would look just sort of very faintly glowing, maybe. But, it's, but what they're doing is showing you what's actually in the data, boosting it, amplifying it, translating for our eyes. So the other big aspect of intervention for the Hubble images is color. You've probably noticed that I've been showing you, the raw images are all in black and white. Um, <coughs> now, another thing about, like I said, the light is very, very faint. Now, you're gonna go to observatory pretty soon, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you'll, probably, you'll look through, anyone look through a telescope at, you know, high power telescope, either at an observatory or backyard telescope? Yeah, no? Saw yes? Saturn once. Okay, you saw Saturn? Yeah, Saturn, a real nice telescope. Uh -huh. And what, is, what color was Saturn? Red orange. Okay, okay, so you can actually see color. Uh, you can see the rings, yeah. Well, if you, if you have a chance at the observatory and, you, and it's dark enough and the sky isn't too cloudy here, it's 
can be kind of tough in this city, but um, if you look at a nebula, like these, these clouds of gas and dust, what you'll see through a telescope is this kind of glowing region of white light. Or it might look maybe faint greenish. Because our eyes, it's so faint, our eyes can, can't register color. The color sensors of our eyes don't actually see them in color, in these vivid, bright colors. So, and so you might be surprised, disappointed. I know that when I was um, recently at a, an observatory in California, and people all were asking, why, when I look through this telescope, don't I see things in color? We've been somewhat conditioned to expect that. Anyway, so what they, so even though our eyes can't see it, and even though the telescope, the Hubble, uh, collects its data monochromatically, it does have filters that are key to particular wavelengths of light. So it has filters in its camera that are for the red wavelength, for the green wavelength, for the blue wavelength of light. So one might say that even though what's delivering is just things in black and white, it's actually collecting color information. Um, and so in order to make a comp the color versions that we see, what astronomers will do is combine together assign, sorry, blue to one of those exposures, green to one exposure, red to another exposure, and create a composite. Combine together these three images to create a full color image. So anybody who's taken an art class back in your youth or even more recently, you know these kinds of ideas of combining colors to create a full spectrum. Yeah. So it's not an art color from the pictures. They did it based on their imagination or sense of art. They based on these like, data that they got. Yes and no. Okay, so yes in the fact, in the sense that some of the images are key to visual light and in wavelengths that we would see, red, green, blue. And so a lot of the image of things like planets, star fields, these correspond to visual experience of color. They observed it with a, blue, a filter in blue, a filter in green, a filter in red assignment. Really obvious, easy, and combining together. Ta -da! So if we had super powered eyes, or this, is what, this would be something like, if you imagine, I don't know, x-ray vision for Superman, some other like super color vision. Huh? Anyway, now I'm just making um, But they can't do that in all cases. So the, the telescope also has filters on it that are key to very specific wavelengths of light that correspond to the spectral signature for particular elements. So if you've been to a science museum, you've probably seen those spectrographs where they split the light into different, uh, through a, spectro uh, a spectroscope, and each different element has its own kind of signature. So the one on the top is for hydrogen. And you notice that it has a really bright line around 650. So they have in the telescope a filter at that wavelength. And so astronomers can use that to detect the presence of hydrogen. And they have one for sulfur and oxygen and so on and so forth. So that's not to say that that light is exactly that color, because of course it's a wider range. But so they keep, sometimes they make hydrogen red because of the spectrum signature. So this example of, for example, of the World Bowl Galaxy, they observed it with a filter in the visual wavelength for blue, one for green, and then one key to hydrogen. So when you see red here, you know, if you know that information, you know, oh, that's the location where there's hydrogen in these different spots, right? Well, that all works fine if you end up with three exposures that fall into red, blue, and green. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes you might have an observation with, for something, or for a set of three observations in which two of them are red. So the Eagle Nebula is a case like that. As you can see here, it combines oxygen, observations made for the filter for oxygen, for hydrogen, and for sulfur. Sulfur and hydrogen both have spectral signatures in the red range. So if they were to give both of those the assignment of red, the distinctions between that exposure for sulfur and that exposure for hydrogen <coughs> would be lost. It would all just look red. Make sense? 
So they want to make sure that they can see these differences that they've been so carefully keying their observations to detect. So what they'll do then is use the relative wavelengths to assign colors. So blue being the most energetic, the shortest wavelengths, they'll assign that, whatever element is at the shortest wavelengths, most energetic, they'll assign to blue. Whatever one has the longest wavelengths, the, the slowest, the, the least excited, they'll assign to red. Whatever falls in the middle, they'll assign to green. So in this instance, that means hydrogen, which in the Whirlpool galaxy looked red, in the Eagle Nebula is assigned to green. So think about, for a second, how different this would look. I mean, there's a lot of greenish color in here. So think about how different this would look if you assign that differently. It would look much, you know, much redder. And so, so the key here, or the other thing I should say, is that the Hubble Space Telescope and other observatories also can observe in wavelengths beyond our, the visual spectrum. So they can observe in the ultraviolet. What color is that? I don't know, ask your favorite bee or something like that. Don't insect, insects can see. But we, you know, they have to make a, choose a color for that. Um, and typically they tend to sign that to purple or something, you know, just because they think, okay, we'll keep going. And it also observes in the near infrared. So what do you get back? And also there's cases where they don't have just three different exposures that they're combining together to create the image. Maybe they've got four. So then they have to make some choices. So yes, there's a key. It's not arbitrary. And if you know the key, you can look at this image and say, OK, the blue is the most excited. The green is slightly less. The red is still less. So you can speak about sort of relative temperatures, relative levels of excitation within this nebula. Um, but you know, in a different image, it might mean something slightly different. So you really have to kind of look at what they use to create the image. But the thing that I think is also compelling about this is not only that there's a key that you can kind of unpack, and if you know the key, you can understand certain things about the scientific processes that are happening within the image, but it also ends up looking like something familiar, right? Those of you who've read parts of the book know that like, a lot of the basis of the argument that I make there is that this looks like a landscape. It happens to be a scene where, by choosing that color combination, the background of the sky looks blue, looks green, looks like we expect the sky to look. And these clouds of gas and dust, especially oriented in this direction, are kind of these brown, orange, yellows, things that we associate with land. So it ends up kind of walking this line between here's scientific information. If you have the key, you can read it this way. But here's also this aesthetic kind of suggestion of a landscape that they're evoking. I'll go back to that in a minute. Any questions? Um, so there's another stage of processing with these Hubble Heritage images. Um, they make choices about, wait, did I want to say this yet? Let me see what my slide is next. No, okay, so they make choices about cleaning up, they do something they call cosmetic cleaning. So they'll clean up different kind of uh, pixels that are bleeding out, or overexposed, or that sort of stuff. They'll also do things like, um, so these spikes, these bright lines that are coming out of the, the, the star, the bright stars, the closest ones, these are artifacts of the instrument. It has to do with how the light is refracting within the instrument itself, the telescope itself. They're not, I mean, stars are points of light. They don't have diffraction spikes coming out of them. But we're so accustomed to thinking, I mean, twinkle, twinkle, little star, I mean, I have a three-year-old, you know, so that's not right. So from a very young age, we think about stars as twinkling. And that's because our atmosphere makes them do so. And then we're used to seeing things like this through the lens of telescopes, through the lens of cameras. So we associate these diffraction spikes with stars. So what they'll do sometimes is if, for example, one of the pixels gets a little bit overexposed in these bright stars, say right here or something like that, and that messes up the diffraction spike on this side, say. So they'll copy and paste, you know, using Photoshop, that diffraction spike on this other side and put it over here so that it has a nice matching set of floors. And that's a really an aesthetic choice. It's because we associate twinkling stars uh, with the night sky, but they don't, and they think like, oh, if it's gonna be kind of off balance, people won't know how to read it. It'll be more confusing than valuable. So let's not confuse them. We'll make sure it looks aesthetically as they expect it to look. Okay. 
Uh, they also make choices about the orientation of images. What's your response if you look at it like this? The Eagle Nebula. What does it look like now? I said it looked like a landscape before. A cave? Okay. What? Like stalactites? I mean, it looks much more like oozing. It doesn't have that same sort of monumentality, lit from above, ah, oh, you know, kind of sensibility. Instead, this sort of sort of liquid kind of sense of something dripping down. Um, and conventionally, images were oriented with astronomical images were oriented with north at the top and east to the left, which imitates the experience of laying down with your head pointed to the north and looking up, up at the night sky. So, um, but for an orbiting telescope, what difference does the north make? You know, cardinal directions are Earth-based. Um, and so once you get outside of the Earth, these things don't matter anymore. And so you have all this kind of flexibility. And so north in this image is sort of up to diagonally to the right. Um, but they've chosen to orient it in a way that kind of emphasizes that monumentality, that sense of the grandeur of the image. Um, and like that image I just showed you of it upside down, you know, it looks very different if you, if you flip it around. It, looks, it gives a much different kind of aesthetic experience. Okay, let's see where in the world I am. Love, 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 love. Okay, so there's a lot of points of intervention. You know, Maya Lynn's right at that level. There's a lot that these astronomers are doing to the data between when they get it from the telescope and what we see in all these different sources. But yet, the Heritage Project has adopted what's a relatively conservative approach um, to image processing that really does adhere close to, to uh, scientific conventions. And Zolt who I mentioned before, quoted before, he cautions that the aesthetic appeal of these images, he said that it doesn't depend on image processing, or at least not entirely. Entirely, and he explains, quote, uh, that he tries to quote let the data drive the picture, end quote. And he believes that, uh, and again I'm quoting, the reason the pictures are spectacular is not from what we do to them, but from the fact the data is better than any other astronomical data that has ever been produced, end quote. So he's really kind of downplaying the um, role of astronomers and image specialists like himself. And I, I think it's fair to read his comments as a response to people who have criticized Hubble images and sort of said, you know, these are Disney-fied, technicolor kinds of extravaganza. They don't really have anything to do what, what we actually see. They're just, you know, throwing up all these, these colors to, to kind of ensure that NASA has funding for its next mission and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, I think he's also Right, um, that there is this kind of careful line they're trying to walk um, when they manipulate the images between creating something that's scientifically valid and something that's aesthetically appealing, that they want them to do both of these things. Um, and the reference to the landscape is one aspect of that. Um, and I think this example also demonstrates the kind of careful uh, choices they're making. So this is fairly early in the history of the Hubble Heritage Project. This is a planetary nebula. Um, and planetary nebula, they get their name from the 18th century when people, astronomers were first observing them and they thought they might be uh, the sites of planets. But now they know that in fact, they're exploded stars, these clouds of gas and dust kind of looming out uh, from that central star. Um, and like I said, this is fairly early within the history of the Heritage Project. And this is a fairly conventional depiction of a planetary nebula. And if, from what I told you before about blue being the most excited, the hottest, and, and yellow, then greens, and then uh, reds being the least, the coolest, in this sort of, you can sort of understand the physical processes here. The center of the star is the hottest, that's where the hottest gases are. As you move out, it gets redder and cooler. Um, and that's sort of the convention for depicting uh, planetary nebulae. Well, the Heritage Project actually thought about doing something like this. And they developed this image, which has, which is a much more kind of free exploration of color. Whatever they want, you know, purple, pinks, blues. It's not incorrect in the sense that 
Well, our eyes can't see it either way. We don't actually register color in, in either of these versions. So if we're judging it based on our eyes, they're both kind of wrong, or they're both kind of created. Um, but there are conventions that make this one more legible, more understandable. Uh, traditions within scientific representation that you can read it then. This is what this means. This is what this is about. This is the scientific processes that are at work here. Yeah. Well, if they do manipulate and they do augment, a real scientist could not look at any of these images from a scientific point of view because they would never know what they were looking at if they were looking at the truth or manipulation, right? Well, I think they would know because the conventions are fairly established. Um, in terms well, they have to do a whole lot of research into figuring out uh, well, I think if you're what they had to do. I mean, I think if you're a I mean, if you're a biologist, you're right, no. But if you're an astronomer and you've been looking at planetary nebulae since you were in college, you would have seen versions of planetary nebulae with this sort of similar color scheme from photographs, from other things. And so you would have a sense of what's going on here. So even though the colors are something that's done in a computer, there's still a tradition behind it that makes it legible if you're a specialist well, in the area. But, but you also mentioned that they put the four star thing, the four star image in there. They changed that whole picture. Yeah, that they don't know. That's true. But at the same time, so, so the diffraction spikes, but they probably would be, you know, a lot of the times the most subjective interventions like that, like the diffraction spikes, are to things that are the least scientifically interesting to those who are within the field that the stuff that they're probably paying attention to is not the brightest star in the foreground. Yes? As a person who's done a lot of image processing, I would say that uh, you look at these things on two different levels and you look at the two different kinds of data sets. So, so when you want to publish something, you would generate an image that looks something like this. But if I wanted to analyze the hydrogen concentration across this planetary nebula, I would be looking at the raw data. Right. And I would never want, and you would publish a different image. You might only publish the hydrogen image, but that's the point you were trying to make at the time. So I think, I think it's a little bit of both, and I think most people who deal with images a lot uh, end up doing it with both. Because I think anybody in science would know this is not the real raw data because it's much, much too clean. And, and it's, it's all, I mean, just looking at it, you instantly know it's been cleaned up. And that there are no real images that look like that. And you wouldn't use that kind of image to do data analysis. And if, I mean, I think it's fair to say that you might also rely on the numeric data, yeah, exactly. even more so, that it's not even the picture, no. un unmanipulated picture, but in fact, the numbers that uh, that actually record the subtle distinctions that, that aren't visible. Um, but I think it's pretty easy when you know what colors have been assigned to which uh, things you're looking at, you can make that adjustment in your head, uh, as, doc as Dr. Kessler was saying, pretty easy, you know, it's like, Okay, I know more or less how the hydrogen is distributed. Whether the picture is red or green or blue, it doesn't matter that much, but that's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, and in fact, the reason why they chose, the, her the folks at the Heritage Project chose not to release this image in this, this purple and pink version is not only because they didn't like the aesthetics, that they didn't like how it turned out, because there were members of the group that were saying, this is a really interesting thing, we should really kind of push it. But then there were other members of the group that said, if we do this, if we release this kind of psychedelic version, everybody within the discipline of astronomy is going to be confused and also think we are, we've gone too far and that the image won't be legible anymore, that they, that they will have kind of gone over some line um, by, by breaking from the conventions of, of how, to, how to represent it. But there, there's sort of room for uh, subjective choice within how they manipulate the images, but not sort of infinite room. Yeah. So would you say that the Hubble Heritage Project is really trying to satisfy both the needs of this public distribution and scientific? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that they're, you know, they, they are part of an astronomy research center. 
So the people that they run into, well, first of all, the people whose data, so blah, 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 back up three times. Um, first, the people that they run into at the lunchroom are other scientists. Um, and so, you know, if they're releasing an image and somebody says, what the heck did you do? I mean, they're gonna get all this kind of like peer pressure, basically, about how stupid that image looks and how wrong it is, you know, wrong being a very open term there. But they're gonna get a lot of peer pressure about this isn't the way you should do it. Second of all, um, the Heritage Project has some allotment of time on the telescope. Um, they can make some observations for the production of images. A pretty minimal amount, though. Most of the time on the telescope is used by scientists, as it should be, you know. And so a lot of the times, what they're doing is going into the archive of Hubble data. And you all could go on there. It's public. It's available. Um, so if you're an astronomer and you, can, you say, I want to observe this, you have a year in which you have priority over that data. It's, it, no one else can use it. And then it kind of gets part of the larger archive. So they go into this archive. They say, yeah, you know, we've never done one of this, this planetary NGC 3132. We have, that's a really cool planetary nebula. Let's do that one. Well, some astronomer originally asked for that data. His name is some, or her name, is often affiliated with it. There's a sort of sense, my, as a, somebody from outside of it, you know, having a sort of explain the anthropological eye to it, there's a kind of possessiveness sometimes about that data. That's my data, even though they, you know, it's, it's shared data. And so if you use somebody's data and you did it in a way that they don't like, again, you're going to get this kind of response of, you're messing it up, you know, this isn't the way it should be. You had a question? Uh, uh, more just a comment, but yeah. I, I think it's interesting how, like, this almost innately strikes her that is being not at all something that could ever be real. Whereas, I mean, the other images, as you've been saying, are still ultimately rendering of something that we could see anyway. Right, right. But, I mean, this almost looks like an impressionist painting to me, like, mm -hmm. it's going to be mm -hmm. some sort of out there. Right. Uh, well, it also has almost like a biological feel, too. Yeah, Our bond suggested like that it looked like it reminded me of a colonoscopy. <laughs> And that speaks to 
another aspect of, um, or another connection we might make to the aesthetic side, the artistic side, is this connection to the landscape. Um, because the Hubble images continue this kind of established artistic tradition of showing these unfamiliar um, places as sublime. And many of the, land, of the Hubble images suggest and look like um, landscapes of the American West. Um, and in the 19th century, just to show you a couple examples of the kind of tradition I'm pointing to, artists like Albert Bierstadt, Thomas Moran, they were traveling to the American West, oftentimes accompanying scientific surveys of the region, and painting these sublime images of the Rocky Mountains, of the, this is the grand, a section of the Grand Canyon at the bottom, um, and then these images are being shown on the East Coast, um, in Boston, in New York City, um, to eager, eager people who are seeing this for the first time. This is the first opportunity to see these really dramatic kinds of landscapes. Um, and these kinds of craggy mountains and, and kind of abysses of a canyon, the buttes of the Southwest, these really become associated with a particular idea of the American landscape. They really become part of the visual le uh, vocabulary of how we see, how we imagine the American West. And the Hubble images rely on a similar iconography, a similar sort of set of um, shapes and forms that that, that, that then we associate with the American West. So if you look at things like the Eagle Nebula, you might imagine it as, as a kind of section almost of these um, cliffs that, that Thomas Moran painted. And here another example of, of one of the Hubble images against one of Moran's paintings. So the color scheme, the orientation, the amount of uh, variation in tonality that give them a sense of three-dimensionality, a sense of form, a sense of shape, all these things come together to make it possible for us to read them as akin to landscapes, as some kind of place that we can imagine going, even at the same time as this obviously, it's a cloud, so we can't land on it. So this kind of tension between imagining it as a landscape and realizing that it's also so very alien to our, our own experience of the of the landscape. Um, so did the LeVay do it on purpose? Did he start was out he, saying, I want to make it? with these paintings? Yes. Did he do it on purpose? Did he set out to say, I want to make my Hubble images look like landscapes of the American West? No. Well, we don't know that if it was subconscious. If he already was familiar with those paintings. Right. They were familiar with it, and um, I don't have the, you know, so I said I was interviewing, um, and I, I came to the project, um, I was interested in, originally in landscape paintings, my, and, and the sublime, and things like that. And I started seeing, when I was thinking about Robert Nebraska and stuff, I started seeing these astronomical images, and I thought, huh, this really looked like romantic landscape paintings. And so that was sort of the question that was behind the research that I was doing. Um, and I didn't really know, you know, to your question, Russ, whether or not this is something they intended, or they knew nothing about it, or where the, where it, where it sat. So when I was interviewing astronomers, I would ask them, so you know, what kind of art do you like? What do you do? Blah blah. blah. Um, and I'm taping them. And um, one of the other founders of the Hubble Heritage Project, a guy named Keith Knoll. And I think there's like an audible like <gasps> of me of excitement when I say something about like so what kind of artists do you think these images might be these Hubble images were you thinking about he says well yeah, well, yeah. you know Bierstadt is somebody who I really like and I'm like oh my god so my my thesis was confirmed so he's talking about and he says you know they're a different thing we weren't setting out to make them look like that but we wanted to evoke a very similar response. 
We want people to have a sense of awe, of wonder, a sense of the vastness of the universe, of its size, of its scale, of its grandeur, of its magnificence. And that that's what Bierstadt and Moran were trying to do as they're traveling to the American West and seeing these landscapes for the first time, and then paint, creating these paintings, you know, taking sketch, making sketches and so on, going back to their studios and creating these paintings, um, inspired by, by these trips. Um, but they wanted people who would see the paintings to share in that experience of the sublime. And so the astronomers, all of them, spoke about that as being one of the goals that they had for the Hubble Space Telescope images. Um, and they talked about how, well, for astronomers being specialists and understanding uh, the numeric values and the data, they have a sense at that level of, of the universe and its vastness and diversity. But they recognize that a lot of people are not going to be able to understand the numeric kinds of basis for that understanding. And so the images become another means to communicate that, to share that sense of, of the sublime um, with those who aren't going to dig into the data itself. OK. So things like the, the picture on the left don't actually look like landscapes in the same way. They're not oriented that way. But again, I think they try to evoke the sense of the vast size, the vast scale. Um, in, the, in the chasm of the Colorado, Moran is trying to depict the vast size and scale of the Grand Canyon. It's kind of an impossible task. How do you frame that? And so he fills his canvas. And this is, is a pretty big canvas probably bigger than the projected image here. But he fills this, canon, uh, this canvas with this kind of repetition of these of the canyons sort of going off into the distance. You never see the end uh, of this, this, this canyon and these rocks. And similarly, kind of move into the depths of, of the nebulae here, of the nebulae here, these kinds of layers of gas and dust um, that seem to extend into the distance. And like I mentioned, almost I think in recognition of, of these attributes of the Hubble images, um, these things that align them with art, they've been exhibited in, in art museums, here at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, where they had uh, special versions of the uh, Hubble images made to fit in these rounded um, niches above these marble pillars with the, with the, the bust of various figures. So, are these works of art? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. In many ways, I think the Hubble images stand outside contemporary definitions of art. For all their aesthetic appeal, for all the attention to craft. Um, you know, one of the kind of patron saints of contemporary art is Marcel Duchamp, who famously put a urinal in an art gallery and argued that what defined art was the concept, the idea behind it, not the craftsmanship. Um, and that kind of impulse is very much, so I think at the center of a lot of contemporary art. Um, attention to things that you might not think of as beautiful or sublime or appealing at all. So things that are ugly, degraded, not something we pay attention to usually, I eat the arm. Um, or only attention to in certain contexts, I guess. But anyway, not in art galleries. Um, and something that's driven by the idea, driven by the concept behind it. Um, and a lot of times, that is what becomes central to contemporary. Here's uh, a well-known contemporary photographer, Thomas Rudd, who the idea behind this project, he took scientific data, this is a survey of, um, uh, of the southern hemisphere done by the European uh, Observatory, the European version of NASA. Um, and he purchased the data, the, 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 the raw negatives, and then reprinted them. Um, and the concept of it, the idea of it, becomes as important uh, as anything else. Um, so in a way, and although, of course, there are examples of contemporary that don't fit these kinds of, of restrictions, but in a way, that means that the Hubble images kind of fail to fit contemporary notions of art, that they're not sort of as avant-garde, as kind of original as, um, as a lot of things that, that are uh, praised. Okay. 
The other thing I think that prevents the Hubble images from being accepted as art is that they're made in the service of science. Um, and at one level, as we've been talking about, this judgment is fair. Um, they're constrained, the members of the Heritage Project, they're constrained by certain conventions of astronomical representation. They can't do whatever they want to with the images. Um, and as, as LeVay suggested, they're not images that are inspired by data, um, as we might imagine for an artistic perspective, that they're images that reflect the data. Um, the colors, as we've talked about, have significance for those who know the key. They're not just arbitrary assignments of different views. But I think there's also something maybe slightly prejudicial about this, this sense that a scientific image can't be art. Um, something based in the belief that, uh, the, the, that these limits um, make it impossible to have a creative uh, or expressive aspect to the images. Um, that the functional aspect of the images, the fact that they're about conveying scientific image disqualifies them because we think of art as having uh, to be appreciated without attention to have any use value. That art should be for its own sake without some kind of functional purpose. Okay, so it was a long time in the art part. And it would seem like whether or not these Hubble images are science images would be a much less contentious part of the day. Am I going over? Okay. Um, it would seem like, yeah, sure, of course they're science. But are they science? Um, you know, like I said, how, I quoted Howard Bond earlier, um, and that it's possible to see in them scientific processes, uh, specifically star formation. And I mentioned that that was part of the pillars of creation, that the astronomers were looking at these kind of little tiny filaments almost, that just, well, they're not that tiny in real life, but um, these, they look tiny in the image, these tiny little things that stick out as a site of star formation. And those um, regions of hydrogen are also something that astronomers associate with star formation. Um, so yeah, you can see scientific processes that work within here. Um, but neither of these images reveal star formation for the first time. Um, so scientific processes in Bond's sense, it seems to me something like a natural process that we understand through the aid of science. Um, but then there's this question of, well, is discovery essential to an essential component of science. Is doing science, does that mean to reveal something that had previously not been known uh, about the natural world? And I think it's the split between making scientific information visible and revealing new information that entangles the Hubble images. Every Hubble image illustrates details about the cosmos that are learned through scientific methods. But not every example shows astronomers something new. And in many instances, the ones that are most uh, popular, the ones that we see the most, um, are, are less enlightening than, than those that, that are than the numeric data that, that lies behind it. Okay. And some of this we've talked about already, you know, this kind of relationship between image and data is something that the kind of concept tension within, within science, the story of science like Allison has described as kind of ambivalent attitudes of a lot of scientists towards images, which he describes as we must have images, we cannot have images. Um, there's a sense that images appeal to the senses, which are easily tricked and deceived. Um, to understand numeric data is to use analytic thought and reason. Um, and this is something that, that means that many people dismiss astronomical images. They talk about them as pretty pictures, it's sort of sense of like they're less than, less valuable than others. But it's the numeric data that allow astronomers to make calculations, determine distance and, and magnitude and other attributes of celestial objects with a precision that our eyes could never match. And I think also, as we've been talking about, the Hubble images are called into question their scientific validity because they require so much of astronomers to make the data visible. Um, these choices are inevitably subjective, or at least some of them. There have to be these kinds of subjective choices if you're gonna make infrared light visible. What color is that? Um, you have to decide how to represent it. And there's this sense that 
because of the inevitability of, this, uh, of these subjective choices, that this sort of taints the purity of the image. Again, this is something that's kind of been coming up in our conversation. Um, but I think this is a kind of narrow view of science, and it sort of ignores the numerous interventions that are necessary to gain knowledge about the cosmos, um, as well as a kind of shifting definition of what counts as an objective representation. You know, we can't see the faint light of the nebula across a wide spectrum. We have to have instruments. We have to have cameras. We have to use these devices, prosthetic devices, to extend our vision. Um, so it's the aid of the Hubble Space Telescope and digital imaging, um, as well as the expertise of those who use these technologies, that makes it possible for us to see these at all. Um, so there are always these translations. And I think sometimes, because the Hubble often is observing in the visual wavelength, we sometimes, visual wavelengths of light, we sometimes expect that we're going to be able to see it like that. Whereas if we take something like some of the other of NASA's orbiting telescopes, like the Chandra, which observes in the X-ray, or the Spitzer telescope, which, is, um, again, these are both space telescopes, which observes in the infrared, we sort of know that those are so outside that we expect these kinds of interventions. And here, this is a composite that takes this image that you're looking at and adds to it uh, the Chandra X-ray, uh, which is in the purple, so these dots in purple, um, and then the Spitzer in the infrared, which is shown as red. So something like this on the, this side is in the red. So you see all the more information that gets added on as we extend broader and broader. Okay. So if we remain with these kind of contemporary understandings of art and science. I think it becomes really difficult to resolve the question of whether Hubble images are art or science. Um, and again, though, I think the resemblance to 19th century landscapes offers an opportunity for us to think historically about this question. You know, few people today would argue that something like Thomas Moran's paintings of uh, Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon are art. Uh, few, everyone would accept it. And few of us would really think about them as science. Um, they hang in the halls of the Smithsonian Institute's Museum of Art and American Art as impressive examples of, of artists' celebration of the country's landscapes. But these paintings, like I mentioned, came out of scientific expeditions. Moran was accompanying those who were conducting scientific surveys for the first time of, of the Grand Canyon, mapping it and recording the flora, the fauna, um, the ge geology of what they're seeing. And um, some of Moran's paintings, not, or some of his sketches, actually illustrated the official government reports of these trips. Um, and you know, again, scientists didn't use the work, the work of Moran, as part of their own process of analyzing it. But at the same time, they do give us a great deal of scientific information. Like I was saying, the Hubble images give us a great deal of scientific information about these negatives. So too does Moran's painting gives us a great deal of scientific information about the Grand Canyon. And this was acknowledged at the time that he was making these paintings. A critic in, in Scribner's Monthly, it was a very popular magazine at the time, wrote of this very painting, uh, quote, it's not paint that one sees, it is a description so accurate that a geologist need not go to Arizona to study the formation. This is geology and topography, end quote. So the sense that if you look at this painting, you get a real strong sense of what the rocks, the, the landscape, what this place is actually like. Um, okay, and Moran himself also insisted that it was a particular understanding of the place that allowed him to paint it, a particular kind of expertise that he had. And he wrote later in his life, uh, several years after this, uh, quote, in condensed form, this is my theory of art. In painting the Grand Canyon of the Colorado and its wonderful color scheme, I have to be full of my subject. I have to have knowledge. I must know the geology. I must know the rocks and the trees, and the atmosphere, and the mountain torrents, and the birds that fly in the blue ether above me." And this is the very type of knowledge that the other members of his survey team were involved in collecting. Um, so one assumes that Moran is benefiting greatly from his conversations. You know, they're riding donkeys through the Grand Canyon burrows. So, you know, he's benefiting from the conversations he's having with all these other experts. And almost as a kind of confirmation of Moran's sex, uh, success of his method, John Wesley Powell, who's the leader of the survey expedition, 
and he was a well-respected scientist of the era, um, you know, Moran wrote him and said, well, what do you think? What do you think of the painting that I made after our trip to the Grand Canyon? Um, and Powell replied, quote, it required a bold hand to wield the brush for such a subject. Mr. Moran has represented depths and magnitudes and distances and forms and colors and clouds with great fidelity. But his picture not only tells the truth, it displays the beauty of the truth. So Powell's praising not only the accuracy of the painting, but he also identified this alliance between aesthetics and truth. So to tell the truth pictorially is to appeal to the mind, which can analyze the faithfulness of this representation uh, to the original scene. Powell's there. He can say, yeah, it looks like that. Um, but to display the truth in the words that he said, to exhibit it is to expect a response to think of the senses and the body, a recognition that goes beyond merely checking the facts. Uh, so it's coupled together, these two modes of expression that give a more complete picture of the Grand Canyon. And so to ignore the aesthetic side of it would only to give you something like half truth. Um, so if we come back to the Hubble images, I think we can almost rephrase Powell there and suggest that the Hubble images not only tell us the truth about the cosmos, but they also display the beauty or the, maybe the sublimity uh, of that truth. So, you know, truth in the humanities um, is kind of this elusive concept today, you know, um, determined by culture, not by some kind of universal rule. Um, scientists are more I think more uh, willing to embrace the possibility of finding truth, at least in terms of gaining a certain understanding of the laws of nature. And Powell's, make, Powell's comments, Powell's words, I think, make clear that aesthetics can aid in this quest. And the Hubble images allow us not only to know the facts of the universe, of the cosmos, but also to experience them at an aesthetic level. Okay, we're wrap up here. So, the Hubble images, we can say, then, have characteristics that we associate both with art and science, and they don't fit comfortably in either category. Um, and we can talk about all sorts of ways to, to, to address that. Um, and we might think about them as bridging this divide that I began by talking about with C.D. Snow, and then many have echoed that later in the, in the last century, half century. But I wonder if maybe it's, it's appropriate to think about the Hubble images as trying to do something more ambitious than just even being a bridge. Um, that they can present us this visual experience that's neither fully art nor fully science, and then ask us to reconsider how we define these very terms and think about broadening them in a way that allows the aesthetic within science and the scientific within art. Um, so in that regard, I think they ask us not only to look outward at the universe and think about how we understand the cosmos, but also to think about, to look back and think about the, at ourselves and the concepts that we use to try to describe and categorize what it is that we see. So I will stop there, but I'm happy to answer questions or take comments and uh, clarify any other points that I
Hubble was launched is that a lot of ground-based telescopes, technologies have been introduced that allow for something called adaptive optics, and so that there are computer programs that actually correct for the distortion introduced by the atmosphere, um, that improve ground-based telescopes and these other very large arrays of telescopes. So they've done things with ground-based telescopes that they, you know, everyone who's affiliated with any particular telescope or observatory always claims theirs is the best, and I have no idea. <laughs> but there, yeah, you want to speak to that, Russ? The uh, Webb telescope, I think, has been postponed until after 2020. Oh, okay. Uh, so, it, it was supposed to be up now, but yeah. It was supposed to be launched by now, right? Yeah. It's now past 2020. And it's deep in the ground. Yeah. It's optimized for the Yeah, yeah. The Hubble was designed to do both visual and infrared uh, imaging, but the uh, Webb, uh, they did not make any. Compromises to allow it to be moving in the visible range. It's really far, far from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as for your question about um, computer analysis of the images, of the data, um, you know, I don't, I think that would be very difficult to do because each set of data, part of it is because of what, what you want as an astronomer that image to show. Um, so if you are publishing, uh, I'm thinking of an example that's in the book. Um, there's an example of the Whirlpool Galaxy as it was displayed by astronomers in the Astrophysical Journal. So a professional journal where they're talking only to other astronomers, no one else is going to read it. Um, the Whirlpool Galaxy looks very different in that version than the version that the Hubble Heritage Project displayed. And so because they wanted the image to show this detail all the way to the center of the galaxy, that's not what the goal of the Heritage Project was. And so I think it would be hard to automate that because images have different purposes <coughs> for different audiences, for different types of research. So what you're going to boost or amplify, just taking out contrast things as, as an example, um, may differ from one situation to another. So you don't want to make it universally the same, consistent, because certain moments are going to require certain types of intervention. But there are applications that are totally on uh, For example, most comets now are discovered by robotic telescopes. Yeah, 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 there right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all computer programs. Same right. It's true for supernovas and uh, you know, all the work on the asteroids, et cetera, et cetera. A lot right. of those kinds of things, all of the image processing is totally automatic. In fact, you can set it up at your house and have it call you when it uh, makes a discussion. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That's, that's available to anybody. But then it's not about displaying an image. Well, it depends on how you define the images, doesn't it? I mean, so, uh, you know, it doesn't, dis it doesn't display the images as artwork. Yeah. It uses the images and through the image processing in an automated fashion to, mm -hmm. to tell you the answers that you are looking for. So right, right. I think it goes back to your, you know, uh, there, there needs to be a bridge, but if you're only interested in one side of the bridge, you don't need to have it go over the whole way. How much do these images cost? Like, how much does it cost to get? An you? Image? Not necessarily me, but like, it can't. The telescope's up there. Like, how do they get the image? Like, what is the cost? It's a valuable resource. So, like, how? Well, you know, you. Well, you're too young. Your parents and grandparents, their tax dollars paid for the telescope. So, all of these images and all of the data is in the public domain. They're not copyrighted. So if you want to go to the Hubble's website, you can download, this is why they're, this is part of the reason why there aren't so many calendars and copy lines and stuff. It doesn't cost anything to create a copy of the image to you as a user. But how much does it cost to make a single image? Like a new image, yeah. You know, I don't even know how one would calculate that. That's beyond my, my accounting ability because you have to, amortize the cost of the telescope over time and however much it costs when it was built between 1972-ish and 
three-ish, uh, you know, four-ish. Um, like how much goes to, I don't know. And plus the salaries, this is, a, this is way beyond my mathematical skills. A lot. Yeah, a lot. They're not cheap. They're definitely not cheap. Um, I mean, it's a, you know, plus you have to factor in the cost of space shuttles. It's super expensive. Space shuttles are like a total money sink. Um, all the astronomers, they're trained, or astronauts, sorry. Um, they're expensive. They're very expensive. I don't have a number, though, you know, because there's too many things in there. Why do you ask? Oh, sure. Why does that number matter? <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, like at the time when, I mean, digital cameras and, and so on have improved your abilities to, to detect things. You can have the telescope in your backyard and not, not the Hubble thing. I'm not sure uh, uh, a lot of people know how expensive doing real cutting edge scientific research is. So, for example, even buying a state of the art electron microscope the area that I used to work in, uh, probably is a three or four million dollar expenditure. And uh, to run a research group that would use that instrument probably would take uh, between uh, about two million a year just to support the graduate students and the supplies and everything else we need. So, you know, during that time, you might take uh, a couple of thousand uh, pictures. And so you say each one of those pictures is many thousands of dollars plus, you know, and that's only paying graduate students at cheap rates, <laughs> paying PhDs. So uh, real cutting, cutting edge technology is really expensive. The, the Webb telescope is in billions of dollars. And so no matter how many uh, photographs we get back from that kind of instrumentation, it's still going to be really Is it good money, good expenditure of your textbook? I would think so, yes. Okay. Other questions, comments? Yeah. So you showed a, um, a slide earlier that displays like, different contrast levels, like as the process is yeah. going through it. Is that process available like, to the public for all of the images? Or? No. Um, in fact, um, the adjustments contrast are much less frequently talked about than uh, adjustments to color um, for the public. You know, so, so if you go onto the Hubble's website, the Heritage Project website, um, because people always are asking about why is it this color, um, every observation they'll tell you, you know, this is shown in red, this is shown in blue, this is shown in green. These are the filters that were used you can usually find that information on color. The kind of um, adjustments to contrast that are made, no. In a scientific paper, for peers within the, who are really gonna analyze and wanna know what happened to this, yes. But, so it varies. It's harder to dig that out. So you would be able to easily find the raw data? You can find the raw data because, again, all this stuff is available to you, I mean, not the, or to anybody. So the, the, one of the things that the Hubble Space Telescope has done over its 25 years is accumulate this big archive of data. And anybody can go in there, you, me, whoever, and you can type in, I want to see the Eagle Nebula, or, or M51, or whatever thing that interests you, and see what the, when the telescope observed it, which cameras, which filters it used, and you can, if you have, uh, the software that can handle the file, you can download that data. Um, you can, and it'll preview for you rough versions of what that data looks like. Um, so you can compare the um, original version and the final version. And sometimes, I should say too, the Heritage Project does have those at part, as part of the package of information they'll put out within it. So when they have a press release and say, here's our new greatest version of this particular galaxy, they'll post, here are the three raw images. Um, but they don't always explain exactly what they've done uh, to those. It varies. It, it, it varies from image to image. Yes? Just, just a comment. I hope we actually get to play with some images in one of the future classes. That's one of the things we're planning. 
on doing. Uh, and uh, a lot of these manipulations, you can act, once you have the images, you can actually do in Photoshop. So yeah. Photoshop allows you to do uh, contrast adjustments, brightness adjustments, allows you to change color views, allows you to do all of this kind of stuff. A typical image, besides just the red, green, blue, in order to get the red, green, blue, you actually need a number of other images to calibrate those images within the, within the telescope itself. So each one of these pictures actually uh, is probably, you probably need to take between 15 and 20 different frames uh, in order to get one image. And we'll, we'll be talking more about that uh, in the class. <coughs> Yeah, for the sake of clarity, <laughs> there's only so much. Yeah, it's crazy <laughs> about how that actually happened. Yeah. Uh -huh. I just wanted to sort of add a comment on the philosophy of reconstruction and, and displaying data, like you're saying. You know, my background is classical archaeology of all things. Uh -huh. But one of the things that we have to do is we've got the raw data that we find in excavations of the foundations of buildings, the yeah, fragments yeah. of pottery, things like that. Yeah. And you know, as uh, virtual reality is starting to take a big, uh, play a big role, and then all sorts of CAD reconstructions and things, uh, we have to try and start to replicate what things look like in some ways in a very similar manner. What kind mm -hmm. of colors are buildings going to be? What size were they? How many mm -hmm. stores, stories did they have? have? And we have to also uh, take into account what our audiences, our scientific audiences, obviously will expect based right. on their knowledge of that. Sure. But then there's the entire classical tradition, the post-Renaissance, that has created this, this entire imagery of what, let's say, Rome is supposed to look like through right. Piranese or Alma Tadema or people like this, that you know the public will expect the building to look this way. Right, so right. as we move forward with these sort of reproductions of things, we're we're you know, we're between sort of art as well as what the science is actually telling us through an excavation. So right. you, you want to think about who your audience is going to be again uh, when you show, okay, we've got a new building, we're re reconstructing a basilica, you know, this is what the public will expect to see versus what mm -hmm. it probably really looked like right, and right. what your scientific community is going to expect. So uh, this, I think, this work is also important not only for the sort of astronomical aspects of it, but also for the philosophy of how do we use data and how do we use it for different audiences and what are the issues that, that affect that? And, and that goes uh, across society. Yeah. I mean, this would even involve people that they've seen the movie Star Wars. Right. You know, it's just like right. me. I, I have a film about ancient Rome, and it's got to do something with early Christianity, and everyone expect, expects uh, Jesus Christ to carry his cross up to Calvary because he does that in movies. But did that really happen? No, it was probably up there. He was dragged up there and put on the cross. So, mm -hmm. But people expect that because they've seen it in Renaissance art for 600 right. years. Right. So it's, it's the same kind of issues I think that you're dealing with that you see in other humanities disciplines. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this, kind of, this kind of work, it, it's fascinating from the astronomical science point of view, but I think it has also applications in talking about how we, we display data and reconstruct the, you know, what we have for scientific yeah, and this idea about the data visualization, like you exactly, just echo what you said, it cuts across all sorts of disciplines. Um, and you know, and sometimes it's, it can work in other directions too, where um, you know it can be simulations and models too. So you have only a bit of information, and then you have to model something based on this data that you can't actually see uh, in other forms. Following on what Joey said, I think it gets us back, at least as far as this class is concerned, to uh, where we started, and that is you know, what we're talking about here is rhetorical strategy. Yes. Right? Um, so you, what do you call the craftiness of the images or the constructiveness of, of any image? Mm -hmm. any, any image. You, know, you talk about color and scale and orientation, and even in your slide of, of, of the world of dark happens to display of these images. Those have a certain power mm -hmm. to both persuade and to move us in certain mm -hmm. ways and go beyond our, you know, our sense of what is real, yeah. so our knowledge of the world, our knowledge of the universe. And if we think back to where we began in the class, even before that, you're absolutely right, so we didn't point to, to confidence, that's really the, the best place to, to, right, to right. take it to survive. But it goes, it, 
it goes back to longevity, right? I mean, that was about language, about yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. of language mm -hmm. to both mm -hmm. uh, persuade mm -hmm. one's audience right, right. and to, to move them in some sort of way that isn't about knowing in the thematic scientific yeah, sense, yeah. but about emotional. Right. Right, yeah, I like that idea, because it is with Burke and Kant that we get from the sublime and rhetorical strategy to an aesthetic experience, um, but yet it still has a rhetoric. Right. That, that's very much a part of it, so absolutely. Right, because you started off by saying that these images both shape how we experience the right. universe and how we know the right. universe, and that teetering between um, experience and knowing. Right, yeah, I mean, in phenomenology and cosmology, right. that's, that's where the spot lives. Right, right, yeah, for part of the imagination right. and reason, these faculties that we have. For him, reason being the, the one that's, that's more admired, more have, has a wider right. capacity. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Well, thank you all for being so attentive and asking lots of questions. I got to say many more things than I was even thinking. <laughs>